All right. Hi, everybody. It's Michael Shermer. It's time for another episode of The Michael Shermer Show. Just to remind you, if you're new to this, I am the publisher of Skeptic Magazine. Here's what our current last year issues are about. Tra uh, gender trans issues, abortion matters. Uh, the previous, the next one after that was on race matters. And our latest one on nationalism and the rise of Christian nationalism and other forms of of uh, authoritarianism and populism. The one we're working on now is on economic and money matters. So we're branching out of skepticism to dealing with more current and uh, mainstream controversies. And to that extent, my guest today is Rachel Moran. She is the Director of International Policy and Advocacy for the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, a leading nonpartisan organization exposing the links between all forms of sexual exploitation such as child sexual abuse, prostitution, sex trafficking, and the public health harms of pornography. She is pioneering international progress in policy and collaborative advocacy in order to actualize robust solutions to sexual exploitation. Her work has been endorsed by Jane Fonda, U.S. President Jimmy Carter, Gloria Steinem, Robin Morgan, and others. Prior to joining the International Center on Sexual Ex Exploitation, Rachel founded and led SPACE, S-P-A-C-E, international organization formed to give voice to women who have survived the abusive reality of prostitution. Here is her memoir on this. I usually hold up, Rachel, the actual book, but I have the audio book for you. I didn't get a, a copy of the physical copy, but it, uh, the audio is great. By the way, the reader uh, has a perfect accent. She actually sounds like you, and uh, and it's a great read. My Journey Through Prostitution. I'm just going to take one second here and read the opening paragraph, just to give readers uh, a sense of what a great piece of literature this is. It's not just somebody just rambling off the top of her head uh, what happened to her, but an actual piece of uh, beautiful writing. Here we go. The purpose of this book is to take something bad and try to alchemize it into something good. The something good here is in the sharing of this understanding of the benefit of those who want an awareness of it, but who have never and will never experience it for themselves. There is something good in that. I can sense it. There is something good in exposing prostitution for what it really is. It is the illumination that comes from shining a light in dark places. It is the essential honesty in showing the outlines as they truly are. Men who use prostitutes superimpose upon prostitution an image uh, of it which to them is satisfactory, agreeable, and pleasing. This image will vary from man to man. The only things which remain consistent are the fantasy element involved in the reality that shifting male perceptions do nothing to alter the experience of prostitution for the women involved. Their realities remain concrete and immovable. It is my intention with this book to lay those realities before the reader. One final paragraph here. I do not expect any of this to be easy because there is another reason why the answering of the first question is particularly difficult. It is because it involves an unavoidable reaching into the self, a painful emotional excavation. The honest answering requires a feat of penetrative inward searching in areas you don't want to dig, precisely because you know what you will find. But as the most precious artifacts are those which must be hallowed from the ground, the most valuable words are often those which must be laboriously quarried from the self. So I am going to be, have to be very thorough. I'm going to have to dig. Rachel, that is just powerful writing. How did you become such a great writer? Thanks so much for having me, first of all, Michael, and, and thank you very much for appreciating the book. Um, I, I always had loved writing from I was a very little girl, and uh, it was something, and I, I love to read as well, and I still do. I have, um, like, my sitting room is like a, like a library you know there's there's several hundred books at least and um yeah it's it's just something that um i wish actually i had made more time for and i intend to make more time for you know going forward the last 10 years since my book was released in ireland it was released in april of 2013 here um and it's just been very much a blur very very busy not as not i hadn't made time for writing as i wish i had and every time I tried to kind of get a start on that, then it would go out in America or it'd go out in Korea or it'd go out somewhere else. And, you know, it just uh, kept me busy. 
Yes, well, it's amazing. I mean, your vocabulary and your sentence structure and just the way you present the story is phenomenal. What do you tell young people that want to be a writer before we get into the book itself? Uh, you know, if somebody says, hey, I want to write like that, I have a story to tell. What do you recommend? Well, it's funny you'd ask that question because it's two reasons. It's the first time it's ever been asked of me. And it's also something I'm thinking about right now is that I'd really like to to tutor people who wanted to write their own memoirs because I've seen the impact that this has had, um, a whole broad variety of impacts. And I know the impact it's had in, on my life. Um, and I think there's a lot of people out there. Everybody has a story in them and they don't have to be as dramatic, you know, as, as my own. Um, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of value and a lot of wisdom in lives that often don't seem at all remarkable on the surface of it. Mm, yeah. Well, your first thing you said, I think, uh, applies to any kind of writing, reading a lot of really good writers and just inculcating their style, vocabulary, and so forth, and just getting a kind of a pacing in your head. It's one reason I like to listen to audiobooks, is then I, I kind of hear the words and see them on the page in my imagination, and then imagine when I'm writing, oh, I like that, I'm going to try a sentence like that, or something, something like that. It just sort of seeps in. Do you not think, though, that maybe you're listening to the interpretation of the person who's doing the reading rather than the author themselves. You, yeah, well, that's one reason be... I like I like to listen to books read by the authors themselves. So this was ten years ago. So it took you. So you were in prostitution seven years. It took you. It was fourteen years later when you finished the book, and now we're ten years after that. So given how things change in perspective of time and kind of reflecting what you know now and reinterpreting what you went through then. How is how, how would you assess your own memoir now, 10 years later? Is there anything you'd oh, change? Or? I, um, I've had to read from it publicly many times. And every time I have to do that, there's always a sentence somewhere where I'm kind of tweaking it in my head as I'm reading it, you know, because I, 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 there's always something that I would change. Um, you know, I, I think it's a little bit too wordy. I would tighten it up a bit if I could go back and edit it again. Really? I didn't think so. I thought it was just the perfect length, but okay. <laughs> we all have our perspectives on that. So, well, yeah. So, but my, my point there is that, you know, going through prostitution for seven years, the year after you got out of it, 10 years after that, 10 years after that, it's going to change your interpretation of what you did is going to change over time. Mm, mm. Yeah, because, I mean, the public perception of what was happening to us was and still is centered on what we were doing rather than what was being done to us. Um, and, you know, I, I, I still find that incredible, even after all these years. Um, and I remember, um, and I either wrote about this in the book or in my blog, I can't remember which, because I blogged for a year or so before the book came out. And um, I don't know if you've come across that blog, Michael, I'll send it to you, it's still live anyway. Um, and I, I related this little story about a car full of women who slowed down and started screaming abuse at us out the windows of their car while we were standing. It was the first street I was ever on. So I was only 15 at the time. And I remember being so amazed that that they would do that. Like the names they were calling us, the animosity, the hostility. Um, and I was, I, what so shocked me was that I, I kind of just felt, without even knowing that I felt until they started all the screaming and roaring, I just assumed that women would just know that we didn't, want to be there but they didn't and you know who knows how many others didn't I thought that they would instinctively know as women that no woman makes that choice um in the face of viable alternatives but yeah I mean not everybody's aware of that no definitely not uh and I think that's one of the values of your memoirs to bring that to attention, most of us, uh, you know, have a kind of a Hollywood version of of prostitution from stuff we've seen in movies or whatever. We can get to that later. But 
But um, that, that was one of the peculiar things from your book that shocked me. Why would women be so hostile about what you're doing? Who cares what you're doing? If anything, you know, you're, you're, you're out of the dating market. So there's fewer, co less competition for them on, in the dating market. Why would they care? Why would they call you uh, these horrible names? I think there's a few different reasons. Um, and I think that they probably more than one of them will be present in any one woman. Um, I think, well, first of all, they perceived us as dirty. That was the first thing. Um, I think that they did see us as competition in a roundabout kind of way because their husbands, their boyfriends, you know, we were in their perception rendering us, rendering ourselves available to any man who came along. And there was a lot of truth to that and um, their own part of the men in their own lives, you know, um, could just as easily as any other man walk down the street and avail of, of using our bodies. So there was that. Um, I think that there, there's several reasons. Um, and if I was to think more deeply on it, you know, it's a good question. And thanks for asking it, because I will think more deeply on it. Well, and then it was like the uh, after your book was published and it got started getting a lot of press, there was some other prostitute that was working the same street as you, or at least she said, and that she didn't remember you and you were a fraud and you made all this stuff up. Like, why would anybody make up this stuff? <laughs> I mean, you're not writing a novel. Uh, but but I thought, thought, found that weird, almost like a jealousy thing. Like, how come I don't have a memoir and get something valuable out of this horrible thing I did? Uh, but I wasn't sure how to how to interpret that. Didn't you have to sue her for libel or something like that? I had to eventually take a defamation case and I won in the Dublin Circuit Court in late 2019. Um, I didn't know how to take it myself initially and it had been going on for eight years before I took the case. Um, I really didn't have a clue what way to perceive what was happening and my mistake was in assuming that it was so absurd that nobody would take it seriously. Um, but I was wrong there because as it turned out, people didn't have to believe that. They just had to hear it, have an inkling that there might be a smidgen of truth somewhere in it. And that was enough for major journalists in very large, well-known publications, either side of the Atlantic to back away from me and to pull proposed uh, profile pieces and um, like there was a major profile piece that was pulled in in America um, that was set to happen at the same time as the US release of my book. So to this day, I'll never know what all that nonsense cost me. You know, I know what it cost me in terms of stress and, um, you know, just just irritation and frustration. But I'll never know what it cost me in terms of finance or connections or coverage or all sorts of stuff. It was a horrible experience. Yeah, but I've not seen anything else and just kind of Googling around your name of anybody else saying that you made all this stuff up or exaggerated. So I, my guess is it's died down now, hopefully. Well, I'll tell you what was very remarkable, Michael. It was the experience of seeing hundreds of people all shutting their mouths on the same day, never to open them again. Um, because as soon as the judgment came out, all of the people, and there were many, many people on both sides of the Atlantic. And I was amazed by the caliber of people because some of them were like local area politicians, there were journalists, there were well-known authors, there were people who you would just never imagine that they would put their name to that sort of stuff, retweeting that sort of stuff. Um, but they did, yeah, and plenty of them. Yeah, I mean, usually people make up stuff like that or exaggerate in the other direction. You know, he was, this, we have a guy now on, that, that's in Congress that just started who made up his college degree. He made up his, he said he was a, for, he was a Fortune 500 banker and he was Jewish. He, his mother was died on 9-11 and none of it was true. He just completely made it up. It's rare to go the other direction. There was a guy, uh, I forget his name now, his book was called A Million Little Pieces I heard uh, and about he, that. Yeah, he wrote a memoir about his drug use and abuse, and, and it, it was embraced by Oprah. Oprah had him on, and he, it turns out he just made it all up. And so she was pretty furious about that, called him back on the show. I guess he didn't know what was going to happen, and she just lowered the boom on him. 
that you just don't make up stuff like that. I never got the impression at all from reading your book that any of it was exaggerated. I mean, it was, uh, but in any case. Um, all right, so uh, let's put that behind us because it's obvious that it's true. What what happened to you? So you talk about, and, and use your story as a case study in what most young women who get in and teens get into prostitution broken homes, mental illness, the family, homelessness, drug abuse, and so forth. Mm. Yeah, well, there's one of the points that I made in the book, as you'll know, Michael, is that there's always a negative underpinning a woman's experience of prostitution. Um, In my life, there were three of them or four. Um, There was mental illness, addiction and poverty in my family home. And then there was homelessness for me as a 14 year old when I was um, out on the street. I, I left um, in the spring of 1990, a couple of months after my father's suicide, which had the effect of sending my mother's paranoid schizophrenia into a, a real spiral. Um, like she had been getting increasingly unwell since my late toddlerhood, I'd say I was about three, uh, when she went, you know, when she started to get noticeably unwell. So 10 years or so after that, when she was significantly worse than my father killed himself, and then she went completely berserk. Um, and I just had to get out of the house for the sake of my mental health. And to this day, I don't regret that. I mean, I really had to leave. You know, there was there was just no way of, of being verbally abused like every minute of every day. And uh, that I knew that my mental health couldn't couldn't hold up, couldn't stand up to that, you know, so. It's a, I, I wondered a bit about this. Would I describe myself as a throwaway or a runaway? I, I think I was a mixture of both because my mother did suggest to me that I get out of the house. But by the time she came up with that suggestion, I thought it was a great idea. <laughs> I grabbed it with both hands, you know. So that was how I ended up in that situation of vulnerability. And what I found everywhere I looked, and this was something that, you know, after the whole thing was over seven years later, And I spent a couple of years really licking me wounds um, from 98 to the millennium year. It was two years. um, Just really reeling from the experience. And I went back to school in the millennium year. Um, uh, And I think I I did a lot of thinking about it and I wanted to really understand what had happened to me. But it wasn't like I, I was doing all this instinctively. I wasn't kind of asking myself intellectualized questions. Um, anyway, when I came to the end of all of that thinking, or much of it, because um, I think I'll still be thinking about that stuff probably on and off for the rest of my life, but one of the first things that really struck me was that, that we were all from various um, situations of vulnerability. Um, it was very much a class issue here in Ireland. In the early 90s in Ireland, this country was as white as the driven snow. People of colour living in Ireland is a very, very new thing. So we don't have the situations that you'll find in various parts of the United States where you have heavy, heavy concentrations, racialized situations with prostitution. That's not part of our history. Although in recent years, with the amount of sex trafficking that's happened, you know, there's women coming in here from all over the world have been now for a couple of decades. But there was a there's a very firm divide, though, historically about what prostitution was like as I lived it throughout the 90s and what it turned into in the decades since. But no matter which way you look at it, what you're looking at is people who almost all women. um, There is, of course, a sprinkling of men and boys and trans people in there, too. Um, But it's a highly, highly gendered um phenomena prostitution and for us it was very much a class issue because you had a huge huge predominance of young vulnerable working class girls who it wasn't enough just to be from a disadvantaged background but you put another couple of layers of vulnerability on top of that the addiction in the parents the mental illness you know etc and that really did render women, usually long before they got anywhere near womanhood, actually, um, just just prime for prostitution. 
So uh, what you mean, I guess, is that a upper middle class or upper class young woman, 14 year old, say, like you were and has abusive parents, but they're well off and, uh, and you leave, you have somewhere to go. You have an uncle or a grandparent or a family member, some other place that's safe. Whereas in your case, you just didn't have any options and you end up on the street with the boyfriend that tempted you initially. Mm. Well, I've, I've said before publicly, Michael, that everything has its history and that prostitution is no different. And prostitution in the 90s in Dublin was very, if I was to remove myself from the emotional aspect of all of this, it's actually a very interesting thing to observe because we had the Celtic tiger that arrived out of nowhere and changed the face of the city very, very quickly. Um, like I, I was born what in 70. What is that, Celtic tiger? Uh, that's the term that the kind of um, the term that's used to describe the phenomenal and very sudden economic surge that we had here in Ireland. Oh, right. So I was born in the spring of 76 in Dublin's north inner city, which is the most impoverished part, you know, mm. historically of, of the country. So having a 70s and 80s childhood, it, it was... There's no words that I can come up with in this moment to describe how astonishing it was to see apartment blocks suddenly springing up around the city. Even the lingo had to change. All of a sudden we were using the word apartment. We'd never heard of an apartment, not to mind seeing one. Everything, you either lived in a house or a flat, you know. Um, the country changed very quickly and particularly Dublin City. And with all that influx of money, prostitution itself changed. The demographics of prostitution changed. The first thing that changed was the punters. Men who had been almost exclusively doctors and solicitors, you would say lawyers, dentists, you know, that end of society. All of a sudden then you had your plumbers and your sparkies and your, you know, building site laborers and the demographic <laughs> shift. And towards the end of the 90s, the language is funny. then the middle class girls started to involved themselves in, in prostitution. And I think that a very critical part of that was that it wasn't any more exclusively street-based and backstreet massage parlor style prostitution. It was in 1992 to 93 that the escort agencies all of a sudden started taking a... They, well, they hadn't existed before that. They appeared on the scene... And the back of the In Dublin magazine that advertised them went from two pages to about 12 pages in the space of a year. So that, so that there were escort agencies popping up like weeds all over the city. So everything moved and changed really, really quickly. But that's to answer your question earlier on, you were saying about middle class women. That was at the point when I was in the last couple of years before I got out of prostitution. That's when the middle class women started coming in. I see. Interesting. Well, I guess what I'm 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 after is what, wh why you why did you go in that direction and somebody else didn't? In other words, kind of a counterfactual causality. What what were the causal vectors in your life that led you to do that and say you're you have a sister, right? I have two of them. Two sisters, right? So why didn't they go into prostitution? You know, similar genes, similar environment. You know that so genes, environment, and luck, or in your case, bad luck. What what were the factors that tipped you in one direction and your sisters didn't do that, assuming they didn't? Um, both of my sisters left home um, around the same age as I did. I'd left at 14. I have two younger sisters and each of them left. Uh, one was 13, the other was 15. And they both came to stay with me before they got themselves on their feet for a couple of years each. And... Uh, you know, you're putting me in an awkward spot here, Michael, because no one ever asked me that question before across all these hundreds of interviews. But you did ask, and, and, and here's the truth, is I told them I, I'd break every bone in their body if they went on the game. And oh that's why, yeah, I was, you know, I, I was uh, the older sister. And I have never, um, it, it makes me emotional to imagine it. Like, I cannot understand why, um, why, uh, anybody, and particularly a mother, I met a mother one time who brought her own daughter down the street. And I just feel like uh, I don't know where your moral compass is by, by the time that you're prepared to accept that 
for your own blood. Yeah, right. So you were almost a surrogate parent to your your sisters, having gone through it already, at least uh, uh, for a little while, and realized how bad it was. And you really needed somebody like that to stop you from doing it. Um. Well, I think the reality, um, because of the backstory and the history in our lives, was that I had always been, as we would say in Ireland, the mini mammy, you know, and that's very much what falls to the eldest daughter in many, many families. I, I wouldn't imagine just here in Ireland, I mean, culturally, and not always in any kind of a toxic or um, negative way. It's just, you know, the eldest girl is her. Her mother's um, kind of helpmate a lot of the time. So that kind of carried forward then when it came to the point where my sisters had to leave home. Um, and and every one of us did uh, at, at one point or other because I have two brothers as well. Um, and uh, I, I was the first to leave home and all of the rest of them um, left in time. And we had to have the youngest brother. He was five at the time, had to actually have him removed, forced the hand of the social services to have him removed from the house. He was, you know, the baby. Um, so, you know, I, I suppose the, the value of telling you all this is so that people understand that when, when you're, you know, driving down the street, whatever, and you see a load of women standing at the side of the road or, you know, the backstory of those women and girls' lives um is is not one that you would wish on anybody you gave any kind of damn about. And where anybody gets the idea that they have the right to then use that person's uh, vulnerabilities um, and, and grief, and there's a whole lot of grief that's gone on in, in the backdrop of, of their lives, to, to use that as an avenue to access their physical sexual selves should be absolutely illegal um, in every corner of the earth because what it is is um, it's a very twisted, toxic way to treat another human being. Um, and and I, uh, I'm glad to see that numerous nations now have made the right move. Um, it's scary, though, to see the amount of them that haven't. You know, very recently, Belgium has voted full decriminalization. And watch this space, Michael, because I can guarantee you that within a short few years, Belgium will run out of all control, as New Zealand has, and everywhere else where they've decriminalized pimping. Mm. Yeah, Rachel, we'll get into that, all that in the second half of the conversation, because I want to drill down on that. Uh, even if it's illegal, it still happens. I just sent you that article by Abigail Schreier yesterday. Uh, about all the the street pimping that's go street prostitution and pimping that's going on right on Figueroa in downtown L.A., it, even though it's totally illegal. So you know it's the, the law is one thing, enforcing the law is another. But we'll get into that in a minute. So uh, why? So your first trick, as it were, you were pimped by your boyfriend. So to your point, you know, why would somebody who cares about you put you through that? What wh what happened there? What was it? Why did he do that? Well, at 15 years of age, because I got into prostitution in the summer of 91, which was a year or so after I was forced made homeless. And I was still then naive enough, Michael, to believe that a man that I met five days ago was my boyfriend, <laughs> you know. Nice um, so I hadn't even been with him a week. I think what he saw in me was um, a cluster of opportunities and uh, he took all of them. I see. So, uh, a way to make money for him, but through you. And just t technically, a, a punter is a John, what we would call a John, a, a buyer of sex. Yeah. Buyer of sex. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the lingo here in Ireland. Right, right. Okay, let me, let, let's talk about the women first and then the men. Uh, since you were in it seven years, you had a chance to meet hundreds of women and thousands of men. Who are the women? Uh, other than kind of the general uh, outline you just gave of your own background, and most of them have something like that. 
um, and you got to know some of them. What what were they like? And and, and just kind of give us a description about why they were doing it and what their experience was. Well, I met a lot of lovely people in prostitution. Um, you know, I, like I said, they all had various forms of tragedy in their histories. Um, I met one woman who was, and I knew her for quite a while. Um, and we were we were close. You know, we lived together and we drank together and we just knocked about together, stood on the street together. Um, I mean, prostitution is like anywhere in human life. Like you come across people you like and others you don't and so forth. And, uh, you know, she and I had a, a good tight bond. And anybody who met her and certainly anybody who knew her in prostitution or, you know, perceived her um, from from an outside vantage point would have just assumed that she was like the quintessential happy hooker, you know. Um. And I knew her a couple of years before she turned around and, and divulged one night, you know, how miserably unhappy she was and how um, just she just told me all her own deeper feelings. And, um, you know, she was a, a kind of a happy go lucky sort of a bubbly person. She made the best out of whatever life had thrown her way. And because she had a positive, upbeat sort of personality, a lot of people wouldn't have seen that coming. Do you know what I mean? I knew she wasn't happy with what was going on because I could see what was going on. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I was living what was going on. But even now I look back and I think about what a good job she did in keeping that to herself, even for me and for years. Right. Um, and so it's safe to say that they did it for the money and that's pretty much all you need to know. I mean, there's other little variables, I suppose, but that's the reason financial destitution and so on no alternative yeah, well, what really bothers me about it looking back now is that i know that if we had have been pe people do a lot of talking about choices michael and uh what we were lacking was chances and uh, people confuse the two or they leave chances out of the conversation altogether and the position i'm coming from is don't talk to me about choices before you've talked to me about chances because if a woman has no chances, then she has no choices. But okay, you so know? you mean opportunities that by chances, opportunities. I think it's broader than that. I think it's are, broader are, are, than that. I mean, oh. for example, one thing that I was missing. But if you had seen me sitting on a park bench in the weeks or the months before I got involved in prostitution, you probably would have said to yourself, "God love that poor girl." You know, she hasn't got a roof over her head. She hasn't got a bed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I look back on my younger self now at that point in my life. And what I really see that I was lacking the most was guidance. I needed guidance at that point in my life more than any physical thing. So that's what I mean when I say chances come in all shapes and sizes, Michael, and we were missing most of them. Interesting, very interesting, right. Yeah, not just economic opportunities, but also some structure, some directionality to your life that most of us get most of the time from our parents and and older siblings or teachers. And whatever. many kids reject it as a pain in the arse. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and that just makes me smile. I'm glad that they have the level of innocence, that they feel it's an imposition, you know? Okay, the guys, who are these men coming to you? I mean, you met thousands. Uh, I mean, in your book, you talk about, I mean, some of them are just disgusting fucking pigs, slobs. They don't bathe. They're, they're, others are violent. Did you meet any nice guys? Did you meet any guys that you felt sorry for? Like, this guy's pitiful? <laughs> or or just, I don't know what. What kind of, give us some uh, generalizations about the men you met. I think um, if I thought that somebody was pitiful, Maybe this is just a, a, a cultural difference in, in language, Michael. If I thought someone was pitiful, I, I, I would be less inclined to feel sorry for them. That would be a kind of, you know, pathetic type of thing. And then you'd wonder in what way do you mean pathetic, you know? Um, you know, look, I remember one time, and this was just, I just didn't know what way to take this, you know? <laughs> but it's, you have to find the humor in what's going on. And I remember this fella bouncing kind of, you know, with this 
bouncy kind of physicality. Like he was just in good form. He was in a good mood, you know. And uh, there he is putting his trousers back on and, you know, he's in real good form. And he hands me his business card. He was a plumber. And he told me that if I ever had any hassle or any trouble or any, anybody ever mistreated me or anything like that, I was to give him a ring and he would come down <laughs> make it and make, right. sure, make sure that I was OK. And I, I'm looking at him and, you know, I was, I was thinking a lot of different things at the same time. Um, the naivety in that was extreme, you know, um, for all sorts of reasons. Um, but the reality is a man like that is a lot, lot, lot easier to deal with. Because he's not out to cause you any kind of harm, you know. He he doesn't understand that he's just caused you harm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But but within his naivety, um, there there there's a strange sort of a comfort. It's kind of like the difference between somebody punching you in the face, um, deliberately, <laughs> and somebody stumbling and giving you the same level of an impact by accident. There's no ill intent behind it. Do you know what I'm saying? There was, look, you know, prostitution is, is, is a part of life where you meet all, all kinds of people with all kinds of intentions. But what you will find running through it very heavily are threads, similar threads of attitudes. Guys like him are quite rare. You know, many, many, many more times I met men who knew exactly how little I wanted their hands on me. And that's exactly where the booze was for them. You know, it's a place where you can express um, evil, you know, in, in, in your intentions and in, in your behaviours in a manner that the person that you're, you're enacting this on can't do or say much of anything about it. And sometimes the safest thing was to pretend that you didn't even know what was going on. But that that was just some bullshit, quite frankly, because you knew exactly what was going on and he knew you knew what was going on because this was a shared experience, you know? So there's a common knowledge there. He knows that you know that he knows and so on. And yeah. that is itself for some men the turn on or the kink or whatever. Yeah. That the fact that Control. you don't want them, that you would not have sex with this guy if he didn't pay for it, that itself is a turn on for some guys? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, look, there's few men who walk through the doors of a brothel who are so naive as to believe that the woman would have sex with them anyway, you know? <laughs> right. So, I mean, they will just tell themselves uh, all sorts of lies if lies are necessary, and they very often aren't. Right. Um, yeah. Were there any that, because you mentioned in, in the book, there were some guys you would see periodically regularly, like once a month or whatever. Uh, did they, they tr sort of self-deceive th themselves that they were in love with you or you loved them or there was some personal connection beyond the economic exchange? Well, look, the reality is if you see somebody every two weeks for five years, you'd have to have an extraordinary bent of mind, um, you know, to not give the slightest sort of damn about them, you know. I mean, from my point of view, I, there was, I had one regular punter who I saw. He was the longest standing punter. I'd met him when I was 17 and I was still seeing him when I, when I got out at 22. And uh, I did, I would have cared if anything had happened to him, you know. I mean, he was really relatively harmless as punters go. Otherwise, I wouldn't have made a regular out of him. He was into dressing up in women's clothes. He had no interest in intercourse. He loved snorting cocaine. He loved drinking champagne. He loved putting on lipstick. You know, he had a wide variety of wigs and uh, all sorts of um, outfits that at that time would have been pretty outlandish. Bear in mind that the internet didn't hit Ireland until the late 90s. We were about 10 years behind the States. 
So he was wearing the kind of gear that he would have been buying from America out of like catalog magazines, you know. And so, you know, um, I'd go up to the hotel, I'd snort a load of cocaine. I'd bring the cocaine with me. I was making as much money on the cocaine as I was and anything else, probably more. And I was snorting half it too. And I was dancing on it before he ever saw it. But he, he doesn't know about it this day unless he watched these <laughs> interviews. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I try to keep a sense of perspective, Michael. Um, I would never, ever have wanted anything bad to happen to him. Just on a technical point, if he didn't want to have intercourse with you, what did he want to do? Oh, well, he always orgasmed. But he, he oh, his see. whole thing... See, the thing about some men who were transvestites and they were into all of that, it would have run against the fantasy. Do you know what I mean? So, uh, but you know... You mean he would masturbate or you would get him off both. with your hand or whatever, something like that? Mm-hmm. I see. I see. There's another portion of from your book I wanted to read because I don't know if you meant this to be funny, but it was pretty funny when I heard it. This was a Let's conversation. Was. <laughs> this was the conversation. Uninten- say this, unintentionally funny por- portion of the book. So you you talk. I don't know if this is. A, oh, this was a guy you called Donald in the book. I think. I don't know if oh, the same yeah. guy you were just talking yeah, about. But him. he. Uh, but this is what. What is this? D- dominatrix, where he wants to be dominated by you. And so you recount this roughly speaking conversation between uh, the two of you when he calls you and wants something and you say, and here's the conversation, me, this is you speaking. How dare you? How dare you impose your worthless self on me as if I had nothing better to do with my time than look at your simpering face. Well, well, how dare you, Donald, stuttering and incoherent with nerves. I'm sorry, madam. I mean, mistress, I mean, madam. You, you know, you ought to know better by now than to call me mistress. I'm not some marriage wrecking floozy, Donald. Madam, madam, I'm so sorry, madam. And then me, you haven't answered my question. I'm waiting and you know how I hate to wait. I'm sorry, madam, I've forgotten the question. Well, that's no surprise, you being the fool you are. The question was, how dare you presume I have nothing better to do than grace you with my company? Oh, I'm so sorry, madam. I'm so sorry. I'm only calling because I thought you might be hungry and need to take uh, take care of you and feed you, madam. Uh, I would hate to think of you hungry or needing anything you haven't gotten, madam. I never need anything. I haven't got my dear because I have half a dozen fools like yourself ready to rush around and fetch it for me. Where are you? I'm parked across the road, madam. Lucky for you. Oh, you know, I never keep you waiting. You never keep me waiting. What? <laughs> and it goes on for a couple more paragraphs like that. I laughed out loud listening to that. I mean, first of all, I guess I'm a pretty straight, normal, vanilla guy when it comes to these things. I just can't imagine wanting somebody to talk to me like that. But I guess there are guys that get off on that. There are. There are. And, and you know, this is the thing is that what I, what I actually found convenient, and coming back to the conversation we were having earlier on about time and place and culture, um, is that in the early to mid 90s, a lot of Irish women, they, they just wouldn't deal with these blokes because they, they didn't know how to deal with them and they found them frightening and intimidating and scary. And I, I, um, I never found those uh, oddities. Uh, I, I didn't I didn't experience them in that way. Because you came as close to being in control of the situation as you were going to come in those situations where a man got off on pretending that you were in control, you know? So that all suited me down to the ground. And I, it, it, the really weird thing about it was, though, like, see the, the exchange that you've just read out there? You would have to improvise all the time. It was just, it was a form of acting, right? And of course, <laughs> you know, you're... You're either listening to him on the phone or more often than not, you're looking in his face. And so you can see how what it is that you're saying is impacting on him. So I would kind of weave my way through these interactions where if I ever saw that I was pushing a boundary that he didn't want pushed, well, then I'd have to very quickly switch and go in some other direction. 
Um, like, for example, I tried to get him to take a line of coke one night. And that was a boundary he didn't want to cross. Um, it's it's a really odd thing that you, you're just all the time kind of dancing around his fantasy in a way that fits what it is that he wants. So you're all the time testing and uh, acting, really, in a very real way. And with that particular punter, I had a situation where he went to a therapist. You might get a kick out of this, Michael. <laughs> I probably should have put this in the book. Um, He went to a therapist who was, according to him, bound and determined to get him to sever his dependency on being dominated by women. Now, I didn't know and I still don't know whether or not he invented this therapist, you know, so as to introduce some kind of a mental tug of war into the situation that he would have found arousing. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. It was all the same to me because my role there was to play along with his fantasy. Um, you know, if I was to lay bets on it, I would say there was a therapist. Or otherwise, he's a better actor than I thought he was. Um, but it, it these are the kind of crazy shenanigans, you know. But I mean, this is the humorous light side of it, Michael. And the reality is most of it's not humorous or light at all. No, you know? no. And you point out, too, that feminists who say, oh, well, look, you're in control. He wants to be dominated. You point out, well, none of this would be happening if he didn't pay me. So they're still in control. They're always in control. Always. You know, it's it's like I said in the book, he who pays the piper calls the tune. And uh, even in circumstances that are set up um, to make you uh, to frame the situation as if you were in control, that's only because he gets off on it. So there's yeah. I've never come across a situation where a woman was truly in control in the sex trade it just doesn't exist. Well, because if they did, they wouldn't be doing that. That's your point. Well, I mean, the the moment you introduce the money as a dynamic, um, when it comes to who's paying who, you know, I mean, come on, we all know how capitalism works. Yes, right. Were there any guys that, um, you know, Brett bought you for the hour or two hours or whatever, had sex with you and then spent the rest of the time talking about their lousy marriage or their lonely or their crappy work or whatever? And then they just kind of open up to you because they also needed somebody to talk to, not just sex? Um, there was a bit of that, but there wasn't nearly as much of it as what you will hear, like uh, from some quarters. I listened to a whole world of nonsense in the earlier years of my campaigning from women who said uh, that, you know, they didn't see a penis more than once every few weeks because all these poor men all these elderly men, all these disabled men, all these lonely men, according to them, there was processions of men outside of every brothel in the land who just really would have been better off writing into the Lonely Hearts column. It, it was just ridiculous. Do you know what this I mean? This is bullshit it was you're saying. So absurd. You will, at times, if a, if a man is a regular, if you see him again and again, he will begin to open up about what's going on in his home life. Um, you know, but it's, it's, it's absolutely not like, uh, there isn't a brothel anywhere that's like a psychiatrist's <laughs> therapy sh- session. scenario going on. No. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. So roughly what, if you were to break it down into percentages, just ballparking, you know, how many guys just want to get off? They just want sex. And when it's done, they're gone. Some that want the sex, but also the violence or the aggression or the domination or there's something more than just the sex. And then whatever, maybe some other percentage, just the violence and the domination. It's not really about sex at all. It's a very, very difficult, if not impossible, question to answer at this stage, Michael, because the world is a very different place today to what it was in the 1990s. Um, Online pornography has influence prostitution in ways that make me regularly consider how lucky I was to get out when I did because 98 was the same year that prostitution went online here in Ireland. It was the first time that an escort agency was set up on the internet. That same agency is still running today and 98% of all Irish online prostitution runs through it. 
Um, so I was incredibly lucky with the time and the stories that I've heard from women in Ireland and elsewhere about how much more violent, um, how much more aggressive, how much more demeaning and how much pornography plays into this. Like I'm, I met a woman who, uh, and there's many, many women, you know, reflected in this story. She was prostitute within a room where there was, and this was in a decriminalized zone, where there's a huge big television screen in the room with pornography playing 24-7. Um, so the men would come in, they'd use her any way they saw fit, often taking their cues from what was happening on the screen. Um, I thought that that was just among, you know, the saddest things that I ever heard when when she said that she would sometimes when she just felt like she couldn't take any more she would just sometimes turn the television off but that they would always turn it back on you know they would never let her have that but yeah, can you imagine having your body used just solo on its own with no influence from a pornography screen imagine thinking of that as a break that's how 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 used to being violated she was. That tour was a break, and I thought that that was as ugly as that story was going to get until I came across the woman who uh, had the pornography playing round the clock in a similar manner. Except the woman on the screen was actually her. It was her own pornography that was playing mm. on the screen. Oh wow! And oh, I thought okay. so. So weird. now you see, we're getting deeper and deeper into the inner circles of psychological um torture that's what that is i don't think that very many men connect to the idea of psychosexual torture by the way I, I don't think that many men understand what that is and maybe it's something i i ought to write more about because they really ought to they need to well there's a big there's a male female sociosexual differences probably with deep evolutionary reasons behind it i i recommend uh, any reading any of David Buss's books, or he and uh, Cindy Marston wrote a book called Why Women Have Sex, in which they explore these ideas and these differences. I think I mentioned to you in writing um, um, uh, Louise Perry's book, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, where she talks about this. Um, th this has nothing to do with prostitution. It's just women having a lot of sex because they think that's what they're supposed to do because feminists have been telling them, you can have all the sex you want, carefree, all the variety of partners you want, just like a guy, now that we're equal. And, it, and so there's a lot of women, not just her, making this case that that isn't so. <laughs> mm. uh, even and if she's right. You're, I've, you're, I've you're, read you're, Louise's book. I know what you're talking oh, you about. Okay. Yeah, okay. And, and she's right in that. But would you do us a favor and send us the links to the other two books you just mentioned? Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, I will. I'll do that for sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, so the, the, the evolutionary psychologists who study this uh, basically start with um, the physical differences between men and women, not, not just physical, but also, you, you know, you produce eggs only once a month. They're large. They're very valuable. They're rare. Men produce a gazillion sperm cells each time and they're plentiful and, and women absorb most of the risk, physical risk, pregnancy risk, as STD risk and so on, risk of violence and whatnot. And men have very little risk. So this is the argument that that male strategy is is to be um, less risk averse, more variety of partners desired, um, and more sex desired, and so on. So, and David has these massive data sets from these online dating services like Tinder and some of the other ones, um, OK Cupid and whatever the other big one is where you just ask people, how many sexual partners would you like in a lifetime or in the next 10 years or whatever? And the men outnumber the women, it's like 10 to one. Or, you know, how many dates would you go on before you'd be intimate with a person? And for the women, it was seven on average, seven dates before they'd be intimate. For the guys, it was like less than one. I mean, there's some guys that said, why go on a date? <laughs> right? I mean, it's, you know, it's almost comical. Or, uh, you know, how many of the profiles that you've evaluated, you know, the thousands on these web pages? Uh, what percentage would you go out with? And for the women, it was like, I don't know, like six and a half percent. I mean, you know, n you know the, the guys stand next to no chance of getting the attention of, a, whereas with the guys, it was the opposite. It was like, oh, I'd, I'd have sex with 96% of them. <laughs> it's like, okay, wow. You know, and, and so these massive differences um, lead to these kinds of different preferences that you see reflected in, in a lot of this. Now, 
to there, it, so for, for a woman to have actual intercourse, this is a really huge, important thing uh, because it's so uh, tied up with risk to your body, to yourself, your livelihood, your future, everything. And, and for a guy, it's just not like that. Uh, I mean, it's not that guys don't feel that way. Guys that are in committed, loving relationships like I am, and, uh, you know, it's a wonderful thing. Um, but, but, you know, a guy in his twenties and I've been there too, you can just have sex and not really be connected emotionally at all. And women have a harder time doing that. This is Louise's point in her book. And I think she's, she's right about that. Um, so to that extent, then let me ask you, since you were so personal in the book, when you're having sex with these guys and you don't want to, how do you deal with that internally? What do you think about, or like, how do you get through that besides drugs and you know, depression and, and all that stuff, which are the maybe consequences of that. Well, drugs uh, is how you get through it, because what you have to do is create a barrier between yourself and the experience. Um, I first smoked a bit of cannabis when I was 14 in my first hostel before I ever w was anything to do with prostitution. Um, and I had my first drink at the same age. And I really didn't like either substance, just really didn't like them. I didn't like the spaced out, zoned out feeling of the cannabis. And I didn't like the sense of uh, being out of control that I felt with the alcohol. Um, but as time went by, um, and certainly like everything snowballed after prostitution. Uh, by the time I was 60 and I was waking up and rolling a joint before I got out of bed in the morning. Um, I was completely and totally strung out to bits on narcotics by the time I was in my late teens and so on and so forth. Um, you know, th that is what you do. Like you have to create a barrier between yourself and what's happening to you. Um, you know, th there's no other way that I've, I've ever seen or come across. Right. But in the book, you said something about, um, like even if the guy asks you what's your favorite color, what 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 kind of jewelry oh, you do you like? Oh, you divorce yourself or, from the you, yeah you, you do yeah. You don't I tell mean, them that, the truth because that would be revealing a true part of you. Mm, I see what your what what your point was. Um, you don't, you don't. You see, these things are all instinctual. You know what I mean? At least they were for me. I I didn't plan. Um out the reasons why it was afterwards looking back that I saw why I was doing those things. Um, I remember being very, very angry one time, for example, when one of them, for some reason, decided it was a good idea to go through my handbag because he wanted to know my real name. And I was outraged. I was in the bathroom and he decided to have a look through my bag and see was there any identifying, uh, you know, uh, evidence. And there was. And, and that was just extraordinarily violating you know, that experience, because I suppose it broke through that barrier, you know, and I had no choice in saying the matter. Um, okay, on the issue of agency, free will, volition, you've laid out a pretty strong case that, that women that are prostituted in prostitution or are prostituted, that's interesting you use that word, they're prostituted, it's something that happens to them as opposed to a, a different language, which would suggest they're choosing that. That's interesting, and I think you make your case well for that. But what about for the men? Is there a way for the men to be victims of something, some crappy home life, poverty, loneliness, I don't know what? Their own backgrounds led them to, to seek prostitutes. Well, uh I think if we really understand, it, and this is this is the problem and the and the relentless frustration, Michael, that even after. It was in February two thousand eleven I first spoke out about prostitution publicly, and that was, be twelve years ago in a couple of weeks' time, um, and, after all of this time, and bearing in mind that was on top of, ten years writing the book in around at that stage um and in all that thinking and in all that talk and in all that analyzing i'm still in the same environment that i've always been where the world just doesn't understand because if people understood prostitution to be a form of sexual abuse this would be a very different conversation 
the reality is that prostitution is the last unrecognized form of sexual abuse. And nobody would ever say of a man uh, or a group of men, rapists, uh, for example, nobody would ever say, was there poverty, was there loneliness, was there addiction, did they have their own issues? You wouldn't go there, you know what I mean? Nobody would, because the conversation would stop there. It's abusive and it's wrong. And then people will say, well, because you're paid for it now, that changes the situation. Well, the truth is it does change the situation, but not in the way that they think that it does. Um, To my mind, looking back on everything that happened now, what I see is that the, the money was actually the cruelest part of the contract. Because that was that was the element that stripped us of our rights to to call what was happening by its true name. And and I do hope and I know if we keep going in the right direction we'll get there eventually in the world. But I think that that's really what needs to happen. Um the right we name have to being acknowledge the right abuse or assault. Sorry? The right name being abuse or assault. Yeah, and if we if we assigned it its true name, well then legislatively and in all the other arenas that we need to be looking at, things would begin to unfold as they ought to. But that can't happen until it's recognized as a form of sexual abuse. Okay, we'll get there in just one second. One last personal question um, uh, on the agency issue. If these forces are so strong, how did you get out? At some point, there has to be something inside you, your volitional self that said, that's it, I'm not going to do this anymore. And you did. How did you do that? I went to see a psychiatrist years ago, um, and he said something to me that never left my mind. It just hit me so forcefully. You know the way every now and again someone will say something to you and you can you can feel its truth, and so those words just, there might only be a few of them, but they stick in your head. Um, so I told him everything that had happened. And uh, he gave me his own assessment of how I had managed to get out. And he said, um, <coughs> you, you never forgot who you are. And, you know, he was an older man and, and he was, I would say, probably a good, probably coming towards the end of his career, like he'd been a long time in psychiatry and, and, and dealing with people various sorts of you know histories and it it struck me as very very truthful and I could really I could feel the weight of his professional experience in what he was saying to me and I felt a sense that in the cases that he had dealt with where people had managed to pull things back in a variety of ways that he had seen that same tread running through their lives uh, that they had for some reason, not forgotten who they were. And when he said that to me, it it kind of, I think it hit me with that level of force because I I remembered lots and lots of little, little experiences that had run throughout the seven years that had become less frequent and spaced further apart as time went on but that were still there. You know, stuff like admiring gorgeous sunsets. You know, walking. I remember like when I was on, on the Waterloo Road, I'd walk up the canal bank on my way home. And it was beautiful, inky black, you know, very calm and, uh, you know. So, and and if I'd be home, early enough, which I often was, um, I would, I had this little lamp, it was like a castle, and all the light came out through all the little windows, very whimsical looking, like a little, you know, wizard's castle, and I would, I would sit and read, you know, by the, you know, the light of this little lamp, and there was lots and lots of little experiences like that, that I could offer up as examples, but what I'm saying to you is that, when the psychiatrist said that to me, and I, started to think about the deeper implications not just for me and my life but for people more broadly i think getting out 
a, f a horrible situation, no matter what it is, and finding your way back to something worthwhile is about holding on to some kind of anchoring within yourself, some deeper elements of who you are. So you have to get a core connection to your true self before you can make behavioral changes. But if a young woman came to you now and said, I'm in prostitution, and I hate my life, I hate myself, you did it, what should I do? What should I do tomorrow? First of all, I'd ask her about her circumstances. I'd ask her what it was that she felt she needed. Um, I think I think the real expert in every single individual case is the woman herself. She'll know what she needs. Yeah. She'll know what's blocking her in. She'll know what's stopping her. Um, she may say that straight out of her mouth or she may not, you know, because sometimes, I mean, for me in, in the closing years, definitely, I felt like there was no place in the world for me. I felt like I didn't belong, you know, and and that would have been a very, very difficult thing to say, especially to a stranger. But I had to establish a bond of trust, you know. Um, I think there's there's a mishmash of reasons and some of them are practical and some of them are psychological, emotional, etc. Um, it's not it's not a simple thing. Um, but I think I, I would say. You know that this is not what you want. You know, I never met a woman in prostitution who was just happy as Larry to <laughs> just keep on going here. You know what I mean? It's, I just never met her. Um, what I resent is the the public kind of perception of what they call sex work, you know, um, all the agency talk. Um, I, I'd really like to know, like, where are the women with options who just decided to to give prostitution a go you know um i wrote an article about six months or so back for psych magazine i don't know if you came across that michael but in it i talked a little bit about the the academics and the female politicians who are big cheerleaders for prostitution for other women and honestly i resent them i resent them more than the pimps i really do you know, I mean, I I do see uh, many times over more than the pimps. Why? Um, because the pimps are simply uh, they they're two different types of vultures. If you know what I'm saying. Um, and I I think I I think that one is far more despicable than the other. Hmm. I mean, because the academic is putting uh, intellectual argument to a case that is really just sexual assault in its core. Is that, is that what you mean? They're making it seem like it's okay? What the pimp is doing, he's doing for money. And what the academic is doing, she's doing for uh, professional kudos. And I find one far more understandable, if not justifiable, uh, than the other. Let me see if I can articulate. I'll try to steel man their position. Uh, and largely, this has been my position, too. So you can then uh, tell me what's wrong with my position. In fact, I was introduced to your book by one of my listeners who's because he's heard me make this argument. It's a basic kind of libertarian argument you're familiar with. Um, in the long history of women's rights, men have always lorded it over women, tried to control their bodies, control their sexuality, control their economic opportunities. This is the history of the world. In the 60s and 70s and 80s and so on, the women's movement said, no, 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 enough of that. No more. Stop telling women what they can and cannot do. Stop that. And that I came of age in that cohort. Like, yeah, okay, I got it. You know, I don't want to tell women what to do. And if a woman says, I, you know, I, I'm going to keep my baby, fine. I'm going to abort my baby, fine. I'm going to have sex or not, fine. Okay, just it's your body. I'm not going to tell you what to do. So that's kind of always been my position. And then the language shift, you talk about this in the book, you know, words like uh, sex workers, I've kind of adopted that language because I feel like uh, in the same way that I would not use the N word or I would not call a woman a, a, you know, the C word, a cunt or a bitch. You just don't do that. It's just, it's rude. It's disrespectful. It's disgusting. Don't do that. Okay, I won't do it. In the same way, I wouldn't use the word whore or slut. 
that's even a phrase, right? Slut shaming. Okay, I won't do that. I, I got it. I got it. I understand. <laughs> you know, sex worker. Okay, if that's your choice of employment, who am I? Tell you what you should and shouldn't do. It's none of my business. And if you told me, mind your own fucking business, Shermer, I'm going to do what I want. I'm like, okay, all right, I got it. That's kind of where I think a lot of people are coming from now after going through the, you know, the, 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 the women's rights movement and so on. And so there, I gather from your book, there's something different about sex, selling sex than any other kind of labor. I mean, so women have opportunities in the labor market now that they've never had before. That's a good thing. And they have birth control and they can control family size. That's a good thing. Why is prostitution different? Why is it not sex work like any other labor? There's a couple of different ways of answering that. and There's probably a dozen or more. And we don't have time for most of them. Um, well, I think the first thing I'd say, and it harks back to what we were talking about earlier on a little bit, the differences between um, the male and female psyche and the way of looking at sex. I've been thinking about this for a while, and I think that psychologically there is a profound difference between what it is to penetrate and what it is to be penetrated. You know, and we could talk for a long while about that. I think um, that's that's a very small part of this conversation, but I do think it's a relevant one. Um, for people who who say that they don't want to be telling women what to do, and you know, like the argument you've just laid out there, um, talking about how much the world has changed from the sixties on, um, they miss a very very important point. And that is that every individual man who walks into a brothel or stops his car in the red light zone, or whatever, every single one of those individuals are telling women, forcing, directing, cajoling, coercing women into doing what they want them to do sexually. And the cash is the coercive force. So you don't get to look at this whole big, ugly, abusive mess and say, I'm not going to tell women what to do and ignore the fact that they're being told what to do in every single interaction in the sex trade all across the world. Right. You probably know about some of these. Well, you were right about the myth of the happy hooker and and you mentioned briefly, you know, these uh, occasional uh, prostitutes are putting themselves through law school or whatever. Uh, and there are examples of that. I, I've talked about several times on this podcast, this woman named Ayella, A-E-L-L-A. -L -L -A. She's the top earner, one of the top earners on OnlyFans. And she makes something like $100,000 a month. I mean, it's at, at her best. It's sometimes more. It's only 50000 a month or whatever. Staggering. And, you know, she says, this is my job. I like it. It it pays way better than anything else I do. And I'm careful about being safe. And, you know, most most of the money she makes is just online. So the guys aren't even, they don't even know where she is. And so on. And and again, I when I see that, I go, okay, well, who am I to say what she, how she should make her living? It's none of my business. What's wrong with somebody like that doing that? Uh, cam, what did they call it? Camming, cam girl, something like that. I don't think it's. Um, I don't think it's the right way to frame the question. I okay. would never say what's wrong with somebody like that doing that. I'd say what's wrong with the phenomenon itself. What impact does it have on society more broadly? What impact does it have? on the people being exploited in these ways? What impact does it have on the people who are participating and paying for that exploitation? What messages are they learning? What messages are take, they taking home to their families? What's bleeding out into the broader world? Those are the questions I think we ought to be asking if we're going to be adult about it. Yeah. Okay, that gets us into the policy issues because you do, you do talk about kind of on a basic level, neighborhoods that have... Uh, kind of been run down because of the pimping and prostitution where there's literally like condoms on the sidewalk and the neighbors that live there, they're like, we don't want this here. This is, this is bringing the whole neighborhood down. The value of our homes decreases, the value of the schools decreases. So that's kind of the, you know, the, the, the political argument why pornography uh, or, you know, the, this is called the broken windows theory of crime. Um, where, you know, broken windows in a neighborhood sends a signal to everybody, no one's keeping this neighborhood up, or graffiti, or turnstile jumping in New York City is the famous example. 
And you got to crack down on these little things like that because they accumulate up, they bring the norms down if you don't do something about it and so on. Would you say that prostitution and, and adjacent to that pornography and other related things like what I just mentioned is an example of that? Is that what you mean? It brings the whole society down, its norms? I think it causes um, a great deal of damage and harm on a multitude of levels, I think would be a better way to put that. Um, you know, the world has changed radically in the last few decades, as we know. Um, and I think that I, I can't imagine what the end point is, Michael, to be honest with you, because we have a situation now where young children, very young children, I'll give you an example from here in Ireland with a, a judge from the children's court make a public statement about how much sexual assault he was seeing in his courtroom. Uh, amongst eight, nine, ten, eleven-year-old children, because of what they were seeing on their smartphones. Ugh, right. um, and I mean, that's just one example. There's, there's yeah. no end to them. Um, another, back to one of the points you made a few minutes ago. There, in the article I was telling you about that I that I wrote last summer, um, for Psych Magazine, I mentioned uh, Hallback in Leeds and the situation over there where the residents had spent years and years campaigning publicly to have the red light zone shut down. The politicians had come along with the idea that this particular zone, of course, a working class neighborhood, where else, um, was somewhere where prostitution should be tolerated from 7 p.m. at night until 7 a.m. the following morning. And everything that you mentioned there happened, of course, to use condoms and the, you know, dangerous environment filth and the you know rubbish everywhere and the whole lot um dirty needles you know everything um and after years and years of despair the locals thought that maybe something would come up of it when a young 24 year old polish woman was murdered um on, on top of numerous beatings and rapes um after that happened uh to my absolute amazement and disgust um one of the the um, academics who was tasked with examining the zone, she declared it a success. A success. Mm. When you, you, you've got numerous rapes, a, a, a neighborhood torn asunder, and a corpse on your hands, and, and that's a success. So mm. what I'm saying to you, Michael, is that there's the thin end of the wedge and there's the thick end. You know, there's real-world consequences for all of this stuff. And as for that young woman that you were talking about, I don't know how old she is. I don't know how long she's been doing this. But where's she going to be in 10 years, 15, 20? You know, you you can't assume. Because let me tell you, at any point in the 90s, I would have told you to fuck off and mind your own bus business. Really? You can bet your life I would have done. And yeah, here I am sitting here now a couple of decades later. Interesting. Telling you a very different set of opinions. Right. I also think that's so rare as to not be a good test case for your theory of prostitution and how to deal with it. Uh, namely, there's this thing called the Pareto distribution, after the Italian uh, economist Pareto, or power laws, roughly speaking, just take something neutral like music, where you know 10% of the musicians make 90% of the money, or professional athletes, 10% of the professional athletes make 90% of the money. And authors, I know, <laughs> as an author, right, only a few authors make huge, massive amounts, Stephen King or some, somebody like that, uh, J.K. Rowling. Most of us are just kind of scraping along in the long tail down here, just bare really eking out a living. So for every ale, A-E-L-L-A-A, -L -L -A -A, I'm not sure how she pronounced for every one of those, there's probably a thousand women that make a hundred bucks a month or something. They're, and they're basically selling their bodies, even if it's just virtually for next to nothing. So that's the, re I think this is your point. The reality of prostitution, this is not where uh, like uh, Julia Roberts and, and, and Robert Gere shows up in your life and rescues you as a prostitute or, you know, it's, or that other movie, um, An Indecent Proposal, well, where, uh, you know, Robert Redford, you know, the handsomest guy in Hollywood at the time that film was made, you know, offers you a million dollars to have sex with you one night. This is not reality. This is your point, right? Yeah, well, it's, it's one of them. I mean, it's one of them. It's, look... It's not reality, Michael, but what if it was? Let's look at that for a moment. Okay. What if every single woman or girl who went on to OnlyFans was just like Ayala? 
and made her fifty to a hundred thousand dollars a month. Um, would that mitigate in any way the harm to her, to them, to society? Mm. I think no, that's I the not. more important point. Right. Okay. I see your point. Yeah. All right. Right. And again, there's something different about sex because you make the point, well, prostitutes wouldn't do it if they weren't paid for it. Well, I have a McDonald's next door. If I went next door and said to the workers, would you be here if you weren't paid? They'd tell, no, of course not. <laughs> I mean, for all labor, everybody needs to get paid. It's something more than just the pay. It's the sex, right? So here's something else I've been thinking about. Um, this is an anthropologist named Alan Fisk, who has a theory about four rela- four different relationships, human relationships. I'll just kind of rattle this off and then let you riff on this. So one of them is communal sharing, like relatives, couples, marriage, partners, families, friends, where you freely share resources within a group. You don't keep tabs. It's all kind of equal and and uh, and there's no exchange of money or anything like that. Then there's authority ranking, like employee, employer, teacher, student, parent, child, kind of a linear hierarchical uh, dominance and status, age, size, strength, wealth, precedence, and so forth. Then there's equality matching, like friends who split gas or informal exchanges, reciprocity, and so on. And then the fourth one, those three all have evolutionary um, kind of components to them in our nature. The fourth one is new, market pricing, the economy of strangers, money is a social currency of exchange and reciprocity. You know, so um, this is why we've all now been trained, you know, as teachers, I'm a professor, don't sleep with the students. Or if you're a, a, a boss, you don't sleep with your employees that, that are uh, underneath you because you're violating one of these uh, kind of these relationships in the same way that if you went to a restaurant, these are violations of, of Fisk's uh, four relationships. You go to a restaurant and at the end of the restaurant, at the end of the meal, you offer to uh, invite the the, the restaurant owner to your house to reciprocate. Well, he's going to like, no, you have to pay for the meal. Or if you have friends over to your house for, for dinner, you, you know, and, and they, one of them whipped out his credit card. Well, what do I owe you? It'd be like, you don't owe me anything. This is a, this is a friend friendship thing. Right. Uh, and, uh, or then my other examples of this, uh, uh, like organ sales, right? Why, why can't I sell my kidney to a relative or a friend or donate it or whatever? And, but it's in many places against the law because there's something about the bodily organs are not things to sell. And in this way, sex is just not something you sell. It's, it's in that category of, of it doesn't belong in market pricing. It, it's, a, it's a thing you, sh- you voluntarily share because it brings you closer to somebody. And even the concept of friends with benefits is not quite right because you're just having sex for fun it, but sex is different still. This is the you know Louise Perry's point. You know, it's not the same as just these other kinds of relationships. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, the the question about why sex is different is something that I'm I'm working on at the moment, and it's a long way to go. You know, to tease that one all the way out. Um. And no doubt that there'd be blind spots in all these conversations, you know, because you'd have to be extremely well read and educated on the whole phenomena of human sexuality, which I am not. So everything that I say or write is just something that I pull out from, you know, within myself, what I think, what I believe. Um, I think that there's a kind of a mapping, if you know what I mean, in that you can you can understand what is true through understanding how you would feel about its impact on the people that you love. I think that people understand prostitution um, very clearly when when they imagine the experience of prostitution um, in the lives of somebody that they love. And that's when the instinctual sense of the wrongfulness of it on the basis of its humiliation and degradation uh, shines through, no matter what you think in terms of your arguments, you know, your political arguments, your libertarian position or whatever it may be. Um, There's all sorts of little clues, by the way, that are all over the place to, and and I, I get great fun out of debating people who hold the opposite political view to me 
because they so often reveal their own deeper feelings about prostitution without even realizing that they're doing it. They do it all the time. It, it's far more common that they do it than that they don't, actually. Um, so, <laughs> you know, like they'll say things like, oh, you're just after uh, a utopian world. You just want to live in a utopian world, you know. And thinking, well, what's a utopian world? It's a, it's a world where there's nothing wrong going on, you know. <laughs> so there you go. Um, those clues are everywhere. and Certainly worth you know, something to aim at. Here's what you wrote that set me back on my heels a little bit because in, in, I have no connection to the prostitution subject at all personally. And so I hadn't really thought about it other than intellectually. So here's what you wrote that really struck me. The reality of prostitution has been hiding in plain sight for millennia. We all know it instinctively. That's why we don't want our sisters and daughters and mothers in brothels. It's strange how something we know on a sensory level can elude us intellectually. The reality of prostitution is not complex. It is simple. Controlling what people do sexually is inherently abusive. So despite all the arguments I made for you there, I have a 31-year-old daughter. I'd be horrified if she was in a brothel. And of course, I would you know, divorce my wife if she did that. I'd be just shocked beyond belief if I found out my mother was doing this yet. Yeah, so I get your point. It's like, yeah, okay, you can intellectualize it, and none of my business or whatever. But really, I mean, come on, <laughs> who would sign off on this for people they love? Well, I think to me that that's that's the bottom line question, you know. And I mean, the clues I mentioned to you earlier on, another one of them, um, you know, the one that you've just mentioned, I think is probably the biggest of all. Um, but there's also the fact that men men who buy sexual access to women. Anybody can understand why they don't go home and tell their girlfriends and their wives, right? But, you know, here's the thing. They may tell their male friends, you know, they may tell their brothers. They won't tell their mothers. They won't tell their sisters. They won't tell their closest female cousins. Now, there's another clue, you know, because leaving aside the the romantic connection that they have with the women in their lives, the platonic connections that the women that they have in their lives are at risk and in danger if they're open about what it is that they do. So there's another clue for you, and we don't have to unpick that one too much further back. Um, (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, I I wish we had another hour. (laughs) It's been a really interesting conversation, Mike. Let's just wrap it up and just give us your best argument for how to deal with it politically, okay? So, uh, you know, do we legalize it? decriminalize it on one end, the buyers versus the sellers, make it totally illegal for everybody everywhere. And and just, but start off with saying, what's the end goal? Obviously we can't reach utopia where no one ever pays for sex ever again. But so it would be to attenuate the abuse of prostitution as much as possible. What's the best way to do that? I believe today what I've always believed and I've never seen any evidence to contradict it which is that prostitution needs to be um, partially decriminalized. That is to say that the women and men involved in prostitution themselves ought to be decriminalized on the principle that nobody ought to be criminalized for their own exploitation. But all of the other actors involved, all the other third-party exploiters, the pimps, the traffickers, the men who buy access to people, um, uh, they all ought to be criminalised and harshly, all of them. I was enormously disappointed here in Ireland when we got to the end of a very long campaign to find that although we got what we wanted on paper, we got um, the criminalisation of, of the purchase of sexual access. Uh, but what were imposed, Michael, were fines uh, find so low that you could find yourself in worse trouble if your dog took a dump on the street. And I think that this is what we, yeah, this, this is so, so it's not just about the way that the legislation shifts, although that's of major importance, but it's also about the penalties. Because if I can get in more trouble um, for my dog taking a dump in the middle of the street than a man can get for using the body of a desperate young woman, what does that say about the society that we're living in, uh, the kind of environment that we want to create. Right. So it's part of the problem that it's just not enforced. Like I mentioned at the start of the conversation, Abigail Schreier's article about the pimping going on in downtown L.A. It's totally illegal, but apparently the police just don't enforce. They just look the other way or I don't know. People are on the 
uh, on the take and there's a lot of corruption. I don't know what the problem is there. Well, I read the article that you sent me and I found it very detailed and interesting. And it seems to me as a personal opinion, I'll tell you um, that I, if I were living in California, I would probably um, leave so quickly that my home would end up like, you know, like a museum, right. like the Mary Celeste, you know. Um, <laughs> I would just funny. want to get the hell out of there. I think that there's a cluster of legislative shifts that have happened in California that seemed to me like um, like a cocktail, a cocktail. Um, and it doesn't it doesn't matter, as, as the point was made in the article, re- uh, really, whether or not the the intent is is. A goodwill or ill will, because the the consequences will be the same either way. Um, I think it's a very, very dangerous situation and it can only go downhill. All right, Rachel. Well, thank you for your beautiful book and for your work. You have a new position as an activist at this organization trying to change legislation. That has to be hard. I would have no idea how to even start. Oh, um, I'm trying to think of something witty, Michael, to sign off on. <laughs> but the truth is, I've no idea how to start either. <laughs> we have a long road ahead of us, and it's, it's going to be a different... And- you start local yeah. and go out from there. Yeah, yeah. I'll be doing a lot of work with NGOs as well. And, okay. And with- I would encourage you to write more. You're such a beautiful writer. You're a powerful, insightful writer about human nature uh, and society. I think that's important. Write another book and I'll have you back on. <laughs> Thanks a million, Michael. Take care. <laughs> All right.